Hello everyone and welcome to the seventh student. Today we're doing C4.2, which is transfers of energy and matter and the final one for theme C. So let's start by defining what an ecosystem is. So an ecosystem is the organisms that live in an area together with the abiotic environment. So remember the abiotic environment are things like a river, the rock formations, right? They're non-living things and the ecosystem are both the non-living things and the living things. Importantly, ecosystems are open systems, meaning resources can enter or exit, including both chemical substances and energy. That is a very, very important thing to remember, okay? So what's the source of energy? In most ecosystems, it's sunlight, which flows into the food chain through producers, right? So plants, which do photosynthesis, although there are some exceptions. So for example, the parts of the ocean where light does not penetrate or caves, right, do not use light energy. In those cases, they can use methane, sulfides, or other inorganic compounds. But in most cases, it's light. And what happens is producers do photosynthesis, and they turn light energy into chemical energy. Chemical energy, okay, is just basically carbon compounds, because when you break carbon compounds, you release energy. That's why it's called chemical energy. So then those consumers obtain the energy from the organisms on which they feed. So basically the consumers are then going to eat the producers, right, and get that chemical energy. So the primary consumer feeds on the producer, then the secondary on the primary, and so on and so on. No, nothing feeds on the last organism in the food chain, right? So within an ecological community, you have these trophic relationships. That's an important thing to remember, okay? If they ask about relationships between species, you can always bring up the trophic relationships. And they're never this simple. They're never just like an individual food chain. They're normally very complex, like the one on the right. They're web-like, right? Um, and a food web summarizes basically all of the possible food chains in a community. So here you have many different food chains. Great. I think this is pretty straightforward. So now let's look at the type of organisms that are in these food chains. So first we have autotrophs. So autotrophs make all the carbon compounds required for life themselves from simple inorganic substances. So they need an external energy source to do this, right? So we have two types, photoautotrophs. So these are the ones we know, right? They do photosynthesis. So um, they use light as their external energy source. So there's plants, algae, some bacteria as well, right? But then we also have chemoautotrophs. So you probably don't know these as well, but for example, there are bacteria that use iron, right? They can oxidize iron to get the energy to make the carbon compounds, right? So there's not only one way to do this, but the main thing to remember, the take home message, is that autotrophs make all the carbon compounds required for life themselves. That's the key point, great. And now heterotrophs basically do not do that, right? They obtain carbon compounds from other organisms by feeding. Yeah, they then digest those compounds and then use those products to build larger complexes. That process is called assimilation, okay, important term. And then heterotrophs can be um, subdivided into whether they digest internally or externally, right? So obviously we digest internally, right? So consumers digest internally and then saprotrophs digest externally. So let's talk about saprotrophs. Saprotrophs, okay, can be thought of as the waste management in the ecosystem, okay? They're super, super important. So basically, producers such as us, we don't eat some body parts. So for example, if we're eating chicken wings, you're not eating the bone, right? But the bone is actually organic matter. It's chemical energy. So that's where saprotrophs come in. They are the decomposers, okay? So they're mainly bacteria or fungi, and what they do is they do external digestion. So this sounds really weird at first, okay, but they secrete digestive enzymes into the dead organic matter. So what we do is we eat the organic matter, and then we secrete enzymes into our stomach and intestine. These secrete the enzymes onto the organic matter first, and then they then absorb the products through active transport or facilitated diffusion right? So hopefully that makes sense. It's external digestion. I'll say that one more time. Great. Importantly though, this is really, really, really important, okay? Whether an organism is an autotroph or heterotroph, they're going to do cell respiration, okay? Cell respiration is required to make ATP in both. The difference between autotrophs and heterotrophs, and so many of my students get this wrong all the time, the difference is how you get your car carbon compounds to then do cell respiration, okay? So in autotrophs you make them, in heterotrophs you eat them, but then you use them identically to do cell respiration. So now we're going to look at the actual food chains.
But before we do so, I want to quickly mention that all of these slides plus extensive notes matching each slide are now available on my website. And if you're still not convinced, you can get a free sample to check it out. And the link is in the description if anyone wants to do so. But now let's move on to trophic levels. So I really want you to focus on this slide because it's super duper important. It hits so many syllabus points. Okay, so what are trophic levels? Trophic levels are the positions in a food chain, right? It's important to know that a lot of consumers, right, can occupy different trophic levels in different food chains. I'll say that again. Some animals can occupy different trophic levels in different food chains. For example, we eat, right, we can eat steak, but we can also eat fruit. So we can be both primary and secondary consumers in different food chains. And so what these pyramids show, right, they show the amount of energy gained per year by each trophic level in an ecosystem. So you need to be able to draw this and you need to be able to label uh, the bars, which is super easy, right? Producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers. And then the length of the bar also needs to be more or less proportional to the amount of energy it shows. And you'll notice here that a lot of energy is lost. On average, 10% of the energy passes through each trophic level. Why only 10%, you might be asking? Because there's a large energy loss between trophic levels. How come? Four main things. So the first thing is incomplete consumption, okay? So this is what I mentioned. We don't eat everything. For example, you're not eating the bones in the chicken. That's incomplete consumption. Incomplete digestion is something else. Some parts you eat, but they cannot be digested. So for example, some parts of plants, the really fibrous parts, you cannot eat, right? Like for example, if you're eating an artichoke, you can't eat the outer layers. That's incomplete digestion. Or you can eat them, but you won't digest them, right? Because it's a lot of cellulose. Third, cell respiration. This is the biggest one, right? Most carbon compounds that we eat are used to produce energy, right? If you think about it, you do not, your mass does not add to the amount of food that you eat throughout your entire life, yeah? Most of it is lost because we use it to sustain ourselves through cell respiration, okay? So this is the main one. And then heat also is very, very important because we all lose heat. Why? Because Chemical reactions are just not 100% efficient, right? So all the, um, basically all the reactions that we do, all of our metabolism has a lot of heat loss. Um, and heat cannot be, lo it cannot be recovered, right? So it cannot be recycled, it's always lost. And this is, these four reasons explain why food chains are restricted in length, right? After a few stages, there's basically just not enough energy and biomass to support another trophic level. That's why you normally don't see super, super long food chains. Good. So now let's talk about primary and secondary production. So what the hell is that? Primary production is the accumulation of carbon compounds in biomass by autotrophs. Okay, so basically how much of autotroph there is, right, in terms of mass, right, in terms of biomass. So biomes can vary in their capacity to accumulate biomass, dep depending mainly on rates of photosynthesis, right? The higher the rate of photosynthesis, the more biomass there is, the more primary production. And you can see here imagery showing, that I think this is by NASA, showing the primary production throughout uh, different months. And as you can see, it varies very widely throughout countries, depending on different conditions, such as temperature and light, etc. And then secondary production is the accumulation of carbon compounds by heterotrophs, right? Makes sense. So, uh, cell respiration obviously results in a loss of biomass at every trophic level, uh, and it also means that secondary production, this is very important, okay, secondary production is lower than primary production. This is what we just talked about. Not all the energy passes through, only 10%, so secondary production, meaning the biomass in higher trophic levels, is lower than in the primary trophic level, meaning uh, producers. Great. So now let's look at the carbon cycle. So carbon flows through ecosystems. So some terms that you need to remember is a pool. So the pool, a pool is a reserve of an element. So for example, in the atmosphere, you have CO2, that is a pool of carbon. Then a flux is the transfer from one pool to the next, the arrows basically, right? And so the, there are three main types of carbon flux. The first is photosynthesis, where carbon goes into the plants. Then there's feeding, right? So feeding is when it goes from producers to consumers. And then there's respiration, where it goes from consumers and as well as plants, right, as well as producers to the atmosphere again. But there are more, okay? Then when the consumers die, right, that's, they can also get uh, fossilized. And then we burn this, we burn the fossil fuels, taking it back to the atmosphere. And then saprotrophs also play a role, right, because they eat the dead organic matter. So ecosystems can have different rates of entry and exit of carbon. Um, so if there's a net uptake, meaning you're taking in more carbon than you're emitting, it's a carbon sink. If there's a net release, it's a carbon source. Okay, so for example, forests are most likely carbon sinks because 
there's a lot of photosynthesis happening, right? They're taking in a lot of carbon, for, but for example, a field where there's tons of cows and no plants, it's most likely a carbon source, right? It's emitting uh, carbon in the form of methane and cell respiration. Great. And then as I mentioned, uh, peat, coal, oil, right? Natural gas, they're carbon sinks, which vary in date formation, uh, but they're really, really old and combustion of these, right? Is what releases CO2 into the atmosphere. Great. So all chemical elements, by the way, are recycled. All the ones we use are recycled, not just carbon. So for example, nitrogen and phosphorus are also recycled, but you do not need to know how to draw the others, whereas you do need to know how to draw the carbon one. Great. So then we have the Keeling curve, which is also looking at CO2, in this case, atmospheric CO2 concentrations. And two main things you need to know, okay? Two things. The first is annual fluctuations. So basically every year, every single year, there's an increase in CO2 concentration between October and May. Why? This is because there's global imbalances of photosynthesis uh, between the northern and the southern hemisphere, right? So that's why they change every single year depending on the seasons. And then the long-term trend, the second thing you need to know is that there's an increase throughout time in atmospheric CO2. And this fits into the idea of climate change, right? And the fact that humans are causing climate change. Great. And the last thing, and this is super easy, okay, is that Cell respiration requires oxygen, okay? But the presence of oxygen is dependent on photosynthesis. Photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide, but the presence of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere relies on respiration, meaning respiration and photosynthesis are inter interdependent, right? Heterotrophs need the oxygen in the air, autotrophs need the carbon dioxide in the air, and they each provide the other one with what they need. So this is super important to understand, okay? This is a major interaction between autotrophs and heterotrophs. Now let's do some questions. So the first one, approximately how much energy is typically transferred from one trophic level to the next? As always, I'll give you three seconds. You can pause now, think about it, and I'll give you the answer. So three, two, and one. Pretty straightforward, I think. I mentioned it before. Just factual. It's 10%. 10%. The rest is lost. Remember, in complete consumption and complete digestion, cell respiration, and heat. Next question. What happens to most of the carbon fixed by photosynthesis in plants? Okay. Three, two, and one. And then the last question is the Keelan curve shows an annual fluctuation in atmospheric CO2 concentration. What primarily causes the seasonal variation? Once again, three, two, and one. It's C, right? I mentioned it's in differences between the northern and the southern hemisphere in terms of photosynthesis, and that's what causes that annual fluctuation, right? It's not volcanic activity. That doesn't happen frequently enough. It's also not due to fossil fuel burning. Um, and it's also not due to ocean currents, right? It's because of photosynthesis rates. Perfect. So this is the end of C4.2. I hope it's super clear. Any questions, leave them in the comments. And otherwise, I'll see you next week for the next video. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good one.